Yeah, what are you looking for? Thank you, ready. Is it recording now? It's recording. Hello, I am Baroness Camilla de la Renard of the Barony of the Flame in the Middle Kingdom. And uh, this year's virtual pins at class is Eleanor of Toledo and Maria of Aragon, who had the better stockings. Well, actually, we aren't going to do who wore it best, but this is going to discuss 16th century stockings, knitted stockings. Now, Maria and Eleanor are very interesting characters because you have two well, well-known women who are, or who were well-known in their time that lived on the same peninsula, died in the same decade, but we remember Eleanor so much better than we do Maria because of her stockings, which is odd. So let's meet these women. Maria was born in 1503 and died in 1568. She's buried in San Domenico Maggiore in Naples. She was also associated with Milan and Pavia. She was the daughter of Fernandino de Montalto. She married Marquesa, Mel, uh, Marquesa Alfonso de Avalos de, del Vasto. She did not have a happy medical life. Her mummy was extensively studied and uh, she showed signs of syphilitic sores, human pamploma virus, and that led to metastatic vulvar cancer. In fact, she uh, has the distinction of being the first molecular diagnosis of HPV in mummies, not the claim to fame you want. If you want further information about her mummy, it's available at slideshare.net Ancient Remnants, bio, Biomolecules in Paleopathology. Now, this is the uh, only portrait I could find of Maria that may be of Maria. That's another issue. It's Maria or her sister. But I cannot find a portrait that is definitively identified as Maria. This portrait was done by Raphael and is now in the Louvre. Eleonora. Eleonora was born in 1522. Let's skip on down to Eleonora here. There she is. She was born in 1522 and died in, at, in 1562. Her, her name started out as, when she was in Spain, Dona Lenor Alvarez de Toledo y Osorio. She was buried in the Medici Chapel in Florence and uh, she had a complicated medical life as well. We know she had 11 live births between the 18 and ages of 18 and 32. So we know that takes a lot out of you. 
she died within weeks of two of her sons from malaria. Now, there was a big scandal at the time that uh, one son may have stabbed the other son, then, and he died. And then Cosimo, Eleanor's husband, stabbed the son who murdered the first son. And then Eleanor died of grief. No, there was a malaria outbreak and they all died of malaria. Maria or Eleanor was further weakened by the fact that she had TB and a chronic calcium deficiency after all those pregnancies, no doubt. She had had rickets as a child. So either she had a poor diet or didn't get enough sunlight and she had lots of cavities. So knitting in the 16th century, how do we know it existed? It existed. Well, there's a lot of art and a lot of artifacts. So let's get right to it. This is a picture from 1465. It is now in Zaragoza, Spain. And people have, when I first started teaching knitting classes at Penzik, way, way, way back, the general consensus was, oh, knitting isn't period. Well, then Richard Rutt published the history of hand knitting and people stopped saying that. Then the thing became, well, knitting's period, but this or that item isn't period. Yes, it is. So we can see in this picture, we have a bunch of saints doing various forms of needlework. We have this saint knitting a stocking. Now the artist knew how to depict knitting on four or five needles. He does that quite well. And he may even show her throwing the yarn with her right hand. Certainly looks it. But then he puts the finger loop braiders in front of her and kind of spoils the effect. Plus he also shows the knitting or the stocking being made from the toe up. Now that's maybe period somewhere, some when, but is it period in the 16th century? We don't know. So he got some things right in some things he did. Now, um, that leads us to Henry VII's household records. These are quoted extensively in the Tudor Child, which I highly recommend. Anything written by those authors is excellent. You should read it. Henry VII's household records are mentioned in the Tudor Child. So Prince Henry, the future Henry VIII is age seven. He received two pairs of long, long hose knit priced four shillings. Now these stockings were probably wool. You are not gonna waste silk on a seven-year-old child, even if he is a prince. That's just not gonna happen. Then in 1502, there's another entry from Henry VII's records. Prince Henry, now 11, received 12 pairs of knit hose. And another little interesting tidbit that happened around this time, a wood carver working on Henry VII's Lady Chapel in Westminster Abbey carves a misericord showing a knitty knotty. Now that's a yarn winding tool that you could use in professional capacity to keep track of how much yarn you're putting in a skein. It's very cool. So we have documentation showing the future Henry VIII receiving wool stockings as a child, which blasts the urban myth that knitted stockings did not exist in England before Elizabeth received her stockings from her silk woman, which is not quite true. 1558, we have Mary Tudor's fool, Jane, was provided with 13 pairs of black knit hose. Servants and children may have been supplied with wool knitted stockings when the upper classes like Mary Tudor still had sewn stockings or a few silk stockings. At the time, knitted stockings in wool were very inexpensive. In the entire 16th century, you have knitted stockings and sewn hosen existing concurrently. And this lasted for a long time. 
there are uh, manifests and uh, suggested packing lists for the new world that mention some of the older people, older explorers bringing sewn hosen to places like Plymouth and Virginia and Jamestown in particular. So this lasts, the coexistence lasts for a long, long time. 1562, now we're getting into the decade when Eleanor and Maria died. They only died like six years apart, it's surprising. You've got the first mention of knitted silk stockings in Queen Elizabeth's wardrobe. There's no confirmation that these were made by Alice Montague, her silk woman. And they were not the first knitted silk stockings in England. Henry VIII and Edward VI both received knitted silk Spanish stockings as presents, according to the contemporary historian Stowe. By the 1580s, several pairs of silk stockings are in the wardrobe list. How did this myth get started that Elizabeth received stockings from her silk woman? Who can say? But it is recorded in Elizabeth's household records that Henry Hearn, the hosier of the ward of the road, wardrobe of robes up to 1592, made 15 pairs of cloth hose and two pairs of knitted silk hose in Michaelmas 1562. Now Michaelmas is a quarter term that uh, described when you would hire and fire servants and it was just a way to say, uh, this is when it was done, it was this time of the year. And it coincides more or less to American Labor Day, it's sometime in September. So Alice Montague isn't mentioned until 1577 in conjunction with worsted stockings, not silk. And this is in this is in Elizabeth's wardrobe unlocked by Janet Arnold that she picks this myth. She plums the depths on it. So we have Maria being uh, buried in uh, 1568. So what was she wearing? She was wearing these silk stockings. They were originally knit yellow and maybe with the right lighting, they still look yellow, but they are now what is referred to in learned circles as archeological brown. I love that term. So what do we see and what don't we see? We don't see any ribbing at the top of the stocking, at the cast on edge. Why? Because while they did know how to use the pearl stitch as early as the 1550s, as the Dresden trunk hose show us, there is no documented use of ribbing in a garment until later. There is a sleeve in the Norwich Castle Museum that has ribbing on a cuff, but it's not structural. It's just to give it flair. The, there's a pair of boot hose in the Victorian Albert that's dated to 1640. It has ribbing. I've been this close to it. But the ribbing is uh, like knit five, pearl four. There is knit two, pearl two ribbing on Gunnister Man's pouch. He was dug up out of peat bog and dated to 1690 by the coins in his, uh, in his pouch which has knit two, pearl two, rib, uh, rib top. So we don't have documented use of ribbing as a structural element, not a decorative element until the 1640s. But we do have use of pearl in these stockings and in Eleanor's stockings, not necessarily structurally, which is intriguing. So how did they cast on? No one is quite sure. There are several schools of thought. Um, Rutt thinks that there was a thumb cast on used, and I don't know quite what he means by that. That might be 
a British term for another uh, cast on that I know by a different name in the States. Jenny Tiramani and Dr. Susan North are both in favor of a pearl chain cast on. There again, this is a British term that I haven't tracked down into American terms yet. And Leslie O'Connell Edwards is in favor of a cable cast on, which I do understand. And I like it to use it because it's a good firm cast on. You get a good firm edge with a, a low curl rate, which is important. Because unless they uh, knitted several rows, turned these over, knitted them together to form a, an edge like this, these edges are going to curl. There are gloves that I've looked at in the Victorian Albert, and unless the edges are the cast on edges are decorated or otherwise altered in some form, they curl after 500 years. So we see just barely pearl used as a decorative element along the seam of the stocking to indicate where a seam would be in sewn hosen. And we see the use of pearl here to demarcate the incep or the arch from the incep and along the heel and the toe. So they had the pearl stitch, but they didn't use it necessarily as we use it today. Now, we do not have Maria's household records like we have Eleonora's. Eleonora has a wealth of information in her household records that we'll get to here in a minute. And another thing to remember if you're going to make silk stockings to wear in the SCA is it is doubtful that you would wear them over your bare legs. They were just that pricey. Uh, you would wear them over sewn cloth hosen still. And here is a better picture of the ankle area showing the pearl seaming to demarcate how the heel was seamed and the stitches picked up and the rows reestablished to make the foot down to the decrease area where you would then graft it close. So here are Maria's linen understockings. Notice that both pairs seem to be about knee high because women don't have to wear thigh high stockings at this time, they aren't gonna be seen. And they are constructed the same pattern almost as the knitted stockings. You can see the seam line. So you can see what the other is mimicking. Now it's not uncommon for, like I said, these stockings were expensive and you would not necessarily wear them over a bare leg. You would probably wear them over sewn linen stockings. So this is the only pair of Maria's stockings that we know about. We really don't know much about hers. We know a lot more about Eleanor's. We know that uh, Maria had this yellow pair and linen understockings. Now, this is a couple of other stockings from the same church where Maria is interred that show the same construction. I think these are man stockings and these are child's. So you can see no ribbing. We don't know how it was cast on. We don't know how they increased or decreased. There's we don't know if they just knitted two together, and if so, in such a way that would slant left or right. We don't know how they increased, but scholarly thought so far suggests a lifted bar increase. Here's a better look at stocking construction at this time of any stocking that isn't Eleanor's, basically. You can see this, it's silk. And you can see the detailing here even better than the pictures we have of Maria's. This is also from the Museum of London. 
This is a wool stocking. The gauge is unknown and it's got a garter stitch heel and you don't see any decorative seaming. So they may not have known how to purl. We don't know if they did a garter stitch heel for sturdiness or because they didn't know how to turn and purl when they were doing this short rows to make this. We don't know. The knowledge wasn't necessarily universal. Here's a better look. And this shows an interesting point about the same stocking. You can see that the decreases are visible here and there on the foot, but they don't, they aren't shaped. They aren't, they aren't symmetrical the way we're used to in modern knitting. Not only that, this stocking is three different colors. Is this due to the way it was preserved? Did the knitter have to change yarns? Was there a new calf on the stocking knit after the old one wore out? Because that did happen. Stockings were refooted or darned or patched. So we don't know. This is a wool stocking from the Victorian Albert. This is the one I was telling you about that dates to the 1640s. And you can see this has what a very symmetrical decrease area to form the toe before they finally grafted it shut. So we know that symmetrical decreases were used in the toe area. Now this is a knitted stocking diagram from Rutt that emphasizes that you would separate your stitches about here, put this batch on a holder of some sort, knit these down to here, seam the heel shut, pick up rows along that selvage edge, and then knit them into the instep and go on from there. And it looks like it would be horribly uncomfortable. In fact, when I did my version of Eleanor's stockings, I didn't use this. I used a Dutch heel that turns very, very low on the ankle. This is modern con sock construction to give you an idea of how different things are. This is the ribbing. This is where the rows are, re uh, the stitches pitched and picked up to rejoin this area. And this indicates the decrease area. Now, this one, this is a French heel. This is a Dutch heel. And this comes very close to what we see in most of these stockings. And then this is an auto heel, which is similar to the French heel, but the French heel goes down a little further. Now we get to Eleonora. This is the portrait that everyone knows about Eleonora. That she's shown with one of her children. And this is, was painted in 1545. So, she was about 23. However, not as many people are familiar with this portrait of Eleanor, which was done later in life. You see, she looks pretty gaunt and she's pictured with a handkerchief, which for a long time, I think, believe was a, an artistic convention to show that the, uh, uh, the person in the portrait had tuberculosis. So, not a happy thing. Now, where am I? When Maria died in 1562, she was buried wearing these stockings. Like I said, she was buried during a malaria epidemic and whoever dressed her for burial must have been worried that um, her body was contagious because she wasn't laced properly and one of her stockings was on inside out. So they were in a hurry. 
These are crimson silk, one of several pairs of crimson stockings that she is reported of, as having. They are currently in the Galleria de Costume in Florence. So according to Moda Afarenzi, which is the book on Italian Wren fashion, and it only mentions Maria in conjunction with her stockings. If Eleonora didn't use, introduce the use of knitted stockings to Florence, she expanded it. As far back as 1545, when the uh, portrait was done that we saw, the records show Eleonora ordering stockings, including wool stockings, to wear in bed. It was common to wear wool or cloth hosen under silk stockings to protect us, protect them. So Eleonora may have worn wool socks to bed. So that makes her a woman after my own heart for sure. Now, um, the Medici records are just so extensive. We know a great deal about who did what. We know that in the Medici household in 1563, the names of professional knitters, Balthazar, Luigi, Giorgio de Gregorio da Verona, and Guido appear in the Medici household records. There is no mention if they specialized in specific items. If one of them had to knit the children's stockings, if one of them had to knit the servant stockings, if one of them knit only the silk stockings, we don't know. The data is granular, but not that granular. So, Marie, uh, Eleonora's stockings are just such a, such a fashion statement that everyone wants to make them and wear them. And uh, there's a lot of myths about them. Some people think they actually have cabling in them. They do not. There was a website at one time that had a bunch of portraits, a bunch of pictures from the archeological reorganization of the Medici tombs and the, all the clothing they're in. So this particular picture shows a, a detail of the chevron on the cuff. So you can see the use of like pearl two banded by knit stitches, making a chevron and you've got triangles down here. So when I made my stockings, I didn't quite do it that way. I used an eyelet to demarcate that. Because there were eyelets in the lozenge pattern. And there it is. That's about as good as I can do. So we see in the stockings, the first, one of the first deliberate uses of eyelets as a decorative element, because we have the Chersion pouches that date back to the 1350s thereabouts, some of them, and uh, they have drawstrings, but we cannot see if they have eyelets for the drawstrings. So that part's still a mystery. So we have a lozenge shape bordered by knit stitches with eyelets in the center around a center vertical post. This is the foot of the stocking before conservation. You can see the basic shaping that is visual in Maria's stockings in Eleanor's, even though they went wild and crazy with all these knit pearl patterns in the stockings. And this is the foot after the conservation. You can see the alternate uh, knit pearl row decoration and the seed stitch. And you can see how they maintain this as they decreased. This is a detail of the knit pearl rows. So you've got two rows knit, two rows pearl banded by knit. This is a detail of the seed stitch and it's in here upside down. You can tell by the 
knit stitches bordering it. And it looks like uh, knit two, purl two. So that'd be um, knit two, purl two for two rows and then alternate. This is the toe decrease area. So you can see they uh, maintain some false seaming along here. Band bordered by two knit stitches on either side up until they get to this point and then they just start decreasing until they're going to retract. This is the stocking after conservation. And this shows more of a mitten decrease. And this is more of a flat toe shaping. So neither one of these in a, a, in a modern stocking looks like what we see in the period examples. Now, what are you gonna knit and how are you gonna knit it? Well, the vast majority of people wore wool stockings. And we know this because wool stockings, wool stocking manufacturers just exploded in the 16th century. How do we know this? Um, because as early as uh, 1578, we have women and orphans being set to spin and knit stockings to earn their keep. It was kind of a workfare program. This was in England where it's best documented and there is documentation for Queen Elizabeth visiting the city of Norwich where she saw girls spinning and knitting stockings. Now the historian Joan Thirst estimates that the English population of 5 million people needed at least two pairs of stockings a year. By the end of the century, that uh, worked out to about 10 to 15 million pairs of stockings a year. They prefer, people preferred to buy them rather than make them. And that means there were an estimated 220,000 knitters, which was 13% of the pauper class were needed just to knit stockings in England for export. So that's a lot of stockings. And remember, they existed concurrently with sewn woolen hosen for a very long time. So the average person is going to wear wool stockings and they are not going to be patterned as prettily as Eleanor's. They're going to have very basic shaping. If you want further documentation, I suggest going to the Museum of London collections and searching their database for pictures of their stockings. What needles are you gonna use? You, they don't know. I, had, I was fortunate enough to ask Dr. Susan North, uh, Leslie O'Connell Edwards, Jane Malcolm Davis. Um, I can't remember her name. The other author from the Tudor Taylor. Um, Kirsty Buckland, what did they use for knitting needles? Were they bone, were they wood? They don't know. So if they don't know, we don't know. But what size were the needles? That you can kind of figure out. The gauge on stockings in the Museum of London stockings, uh, some of them range are from about six and three quarters stitches to the inch to eight and a quarter stitches to the inch and 10 to 13, point, uh, 13 and three quarter rows to the inch. So that's getting kind of small, but not as small as a child stocking from the Museum of London, which is 11 and a quarter stitches to the inch. There's also a silk stocking in the Museum of London. I think the one that I showed 18 stitches to the inch. So when you get into a gauge like that, um, you're talking either super fine wool or you're talking about silk. And um, possibly without any wool in it. I've, I've always thought there had to be a smidgen of wool in there, but I'm not sure. So you're going to be using whatever needles you can get to make that gauge. 
So when you're talking tiny needles, this is three quarters of a millimeter. And when I use this with two strands of size 60 silk thread, I get about 16 and a half stitches to the inch. So this is what you're looking at when you go that small. Now, to make enough needles at a price that I like, because I like to work, if I'm working on stockings or gloves, I like to work on both of them at the same time. So that means I need enough needles to do both of them at the same time. What you do, you go to a model railroad store, radio controlled airplane store, and they will have bins of wire. You find out what size wire you need in millimeters because that's how it's measured. And you buy it uh, for about five bucks for a yard thereabouts. Then you snip it with bolt cutters and you put a smooth taper on it at the bench grinder and you buff it smooth on a wire wheel. And that way you don't cry if you lose one and you can make them whatever length you want. Now at a higher gauge, I am currently knitting a sleeve using a sport white yarn and I'm getting it at about nine stitches to the inch. And this is on a size zero needle, that's two millimeters. So this is what it looks like. Now there again, you can go to the model railroad store and find wire this size, or possibly take your handy dandy needle gauge to the hobby store and find a wooden dowel rod the size you want. So you just um, saw the dowel rod the length you want, put it in a pencil sharpener, put a point on it, buff it smooth, maybe uh, rub a little bit of beeswax or clear shoe polish on it, and you're off. And that way you can cut them the length that you want and you won't cry if you would lose one. Some of those um, super small knitting needle sets, um, they're kind of pricey, but this way you won't have to care as much. So what else do we know and don't know? No ribbing, wool for anyone under nobility. You really would not wear silk stockings next to your skin. We don't know exactly how they increased or decreased. The, there's samples in the, um, one of the books from the Museum of London that shows that they knit two together, but we don't know if it's slanted left or right. They may have used a lifted bar increase. We don't know exactly how they cast on. There's several theories. And uh, no one has really discussed how they grafted the toe closed. What else? Um, the reason you have to be careful about silk stockings is that they were for the upper classes. And there was a wonderful story in Rut that I sincerely hope is true. There was a young man of the household who was really trying to dress just above his station and really make a name for himself by looking oh so fashionable. And one of the senior members of the household got him in a corner and said, I have silk stockings too, and I only wear mine on Sundays. So it was not uncommon to be put in your place when these things happened. So remember men, uh, women wore knee highs and men wore thigh highs generally. I will not talk in absolutes because anything I tell you today could be contradicted by a grapevine tomorrow. But I would like to leave you with this.
This reinforces the idea that uh, men wore the first thigh highs because here's a pair of black silk stockings sewn to some trunk hose. So what does that make it? Manty hose. So go forth and knit stockings. Um, the gauges range from six and three quarters stitches to the inch all the way up to 18 stitches to the inch. The coarser it is, the more likely it's wool. The majority of them are gonna be wool. Go forth, knit stockings, have fun. If you have any questions and uh, I'm not successful in uploading my bibliography, please contact me at ericbob2 at att.net. That's E-R-I-C-K-B-O-B-2 at att.net. Have fun. Show your card again. Show good the first time. Too close. Way too close. Back off. Back off. Back off. Back off. Any other cards? 